So this is the recording for the class on Monday, July 12th. Um, and I assigned you two readings from the book, Einstein's God, Conversations About Science and the Human Spirit. So um, the first week of class, we talked about Plato and uh, Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. And I just told you, this is the foundation of education for a democracy in Western society. Um, it unifies the foundation for Western civilization, involves the unity of a certain view of humanity, a certain kind of humanism with Christianity. But there's nothing incompatible with that. And Chinese humanism, many of our founders really admired Confucius, and we'll read about that later on. So many of our founders were extremely broad-minded, right? To the point where they would have been condemned by anybody remotely conservative or traditional. So, so that was the first week to focus on how Athens set up its democracy, how it lost its democracy, and analogies with our own society today. And then the foundation of humanism and linking it to Christianity and the foundation and the development uh, of America today and whether or not the majority of people in the US still accept the traditional point of view. I am the most traditional of traditionalists actually. Um, and you could think about that, that technically, actually, I'm extremely traditional. I like the Western intellectual tradition. I think it of course has to uh, become more inclusive and you, you, sh you have to interpret it as not sexist, not racist, um, not discriminatory on the basis of sexual orientation or religious belief or ethnicity. Um, but a lot of our founders were already heading in that direction of more inclusivity. So I'm very much um, in the same uh, place on the spectrum. They were more progressive than I am, but because um, I don't want to declare war in my country. <laughs> okay, so this week we are talking about, for the first few days especially, the union of science and religion once again, because that has been the foundation of our founders. They rethought the idea of God so that there would be a union between science and religion. And the way it plays out today, and I'm uh, focusing on this book, but I do want you to know that Krista Tippett has a website that you can go to www.onbeing.org. There are hundreds of tapings of, of interviews that she had. And the one thing in common with that all of them have in common is some sort of integration of science, social science, religion, the arts, philosophy, all aspects of culture. Um, and you could for extra credit, you could look at any of them and write an extra post so that's where we're going. These first articles for today relate to Aristotle's personal virtues. And so the first one is related to Mr. Newland, whether you believe that people are born by nature good or by nature bad or neither. <laughs> so Aristotle thought we are not born either virtuous or vicious, 
But every single day, you are learning something that's developing your character. Every single day, a child is not only behaving a certain way, but taking pleasure in the way they're behaving. And the pleasure that they take in the behavior is what prints itself more deeply in their minds and forms character. Um, so Mr. Newlands, uh, one of his main points is that he was raised to feel guilty. He, Orthodox Judaism, he says, doesn't have to lead to extreme guilt and obsessional thinking, being fixated on, oh, on fear. So he grew up completely afraid of making a mistake of going to hell, whatever. And he completely rejected it. He went through a serious depression and his final coming out was that actually physiologically, <laughs> Our brains have evolved to take so that we flourish when we take pleasure in beauty, in cooperation, in uh, scientific investigation, in using all of those capacities and functioning at a very high level. So to me, that sounds a lot like Aristotle, even though he doesn't bring it in. But you can bring it in, right? On your post, you can bring these things in. So I'm asked, there's a reason why Dr. Beck assigns these articles in the order that she assigns them. So it's a setup, guys. Two plus two. What do you think? Um, so let me just look at what you see on the website. Here are all the, the cover of the book. I did scan both articles in case you had not yet bought the book, but you are required to buy the book because it's against the law, actually, to do what I'm doing. And we are going to read more articles later on in the semester, so it never gets like, oh, we'll just read today and tomorrow, and then I don't have to have bought the book. You do have to buy the book. It's not expensive. You can get it used. All right. So let's go to the first article is Mr. Newland. These are some of the points that I will talk about after you've made your points. So the way the class will go is we will start out with you presenting your papers and taking questions from the other students. Then I will ask you what your response to the Newland article is, okay? So um, the, this quote, you know, the sense of chaos, we sometimes yield to it, but we seek balance, all right? And he, then he says that's actually this desire for balance and the desire for transcendence, getting beyond what's immediate, is actually rooted in our flesh and bone. You know, it's the product of a long system of evolution with a very complex way that the systems of the body work together. It doesn't rule out the idea of a creator, but it doesn't demand one either. So you can look at the human body, you can study it and really take pleasure in it and enjoy it and confirm all the traditional virtues we've been talking about. And you could be an atheist, an agnostic, a Christian, a Buddhist, a Jew, uh, anything, doesn't matter. So that's where we're going. Um, all right. Uh, then that constantly seeking a mean between extremes, that's Aristotle's doctrine of the mean. Um, the quality of the human spirit, right? So I think his view of the spirit is what I meant by spiritual humanism. It created the moral and aesthetic nutriment. So um, it's 
learning how to, to cooperate with other people, learning how to appreciate beauty, learning how to uh, engage in discovery, scientific discovery, or other kinds of discoveries and inventions, being creative. Um, so we, we developed that and we pass it down to the next generation. Then they pick up on that and start at a higher level. And so that's how so society can evolve over time. The way that works in terms of brain chemistry is that the limbic system is the one tied to our emotions and it's close to the brain stem and it's connected to the brain stem. So those uh, incredibly primitive drives of pleasure and fear that we share with the animals. That's part of the limbic system, but the cerebral cortex is a different part of the brain. And it, the way it sends signals, right, to the other parts is um, that's the balance. We want to get all those systems to actually function together pretty well. When you're feeling guilty, right? The cerebral cortex is holding down the limbic system, right? Trying to, you know, don't think about sex, don't act on your sex impulse, don't do this, don't do that. That's, that's not going to make your brain function very well. Whether that will show up on a CAT scan, I don't know, but Mr. Newland is appealing to a basic intuition. Um, we can maintain a much better equilibrium in our lives if we basically take pleasure in doing good things. And then we have to respond to fear, but we're not going to overreact. And so the cerebral cortex will check us when we want to overreact. Um, the way we use our consciousness to synthesize something better, okay? So the human spirit isn't just consciousness because I can be aware that I really want to take revenge or I really want to be self-indulgent. The human spirit is this desire to um, go beyond that, right? I don't want, I really, I have an instinct for revenge, but that's not what I want. That's not the person I want to be, right? I want to be a person that forgives. And you could say, because Jesus says it, or you could just say, because I want it. And the problem with saying, because Jesus says it, is so many Christians <laughs> use Christianity to justify revenge. So that, that is going to mess up your mind, right? If somebody taps your revenge instinct and with Christian and then repression, and somebody else taps the same drive using Christian and then legitimizes it, your brain is going to get pretty messed up. And so what he's saying is that, no, there is a, a better way and even a best way in theory to live this life of the spirit and um, live an energetic, happy flourishing life. Um, a number of my students have talked about Newland's description of his upbringing as an Orthodox Jew. A number of Lyon students were raised under very repressive, emotionally repressive circumstances and appeals to fear based on God. I've had students who had Baptist preacher fathers, I guess they can't have Baptist preacher mothers. Um, and they, you know, they, they identify with Mr. Newland. Some of them go through a period of depression. So Mr. Newland would just say that kind of religion is toxic, right? It's not in the Sermon on the Mount and it's not good for you physiologically, it's not good for you in the way you treat other people. Um, and, but, right, you don't have to give up religion. That isn't even real religion, is what he's saying. 
Um, there are lots of things about Mr. Newland, and I will try to take some excerpts from the interview and play them for you. Um, he's a very sympathetic character. He, you can tell that he has a lot of empathy. And one of his big things is that you really need to listen to other people. Um, let me see. Some of my favorite quotes. Um, be kind to ever, for everyone you meet is carrying a great burden. It helps explain so many things about other people and explains things about yourself. It teaches you moderation in your response to other people's behavior. Everybody needs to be understood. Out of that comes every form of life. And he does say, you know, if people sit down and try to have dialogue, which is the liberally minded person, the definition that I keep emphasizing, fairness to opposing points of view, if you sit down and have dialogue, then he says all these neurotic behaviors will actually go away. And I think you know what he means, like you're fixated because you get pleasure in demonizing another person or you're afraid of the person or you're afraid of not getting the approval of the people in your social group. So you have to demonize another person. If you just sit down and talk to them, that behavior will go away. People fear what they don't understand and they fear who they don't understand. Um, let's see, Newland also says, the art of medicine, the way he describes it, is when he does surgery, he's amazed at how many systems in the body there are, how complicated it is. And then he, his job is just to remove a certain obstacle or a, a tumor or something. All he does is remove an obstacle so that the body can heal itself. And so uh, in terms of culture, He's trying to remove obstacles of false opinions so that the mind, the spirit, can naturally operate the way it was meant to in a healthy way. Um, so here's some other questions. I think that, um, let me see if this is a longer outline. Oh no, that's the wrong one, sorry. Um, Okay, I just have a longer, a longer outline here. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, all right. So, oh, that's just one page, all right. So I have a longer outline in front of me. Um, and I, okay. All right, so one more quote, and then I'll let you go. I'll go to the next topic. What is needed between science and religions is not a debate, but a conversation. Each one saying, okay, you're here to stay, and I'm here to stay. So let's find out how our relationship can be of greatest benefit to this world. So Mr. Newland studied Maimonides. And he says it was in the modern world that science and religion got split. They were not split in the ancient world when the goal of life was wisdom. So Maimonides was a Jewish philosopher and doctor, and he didn't split religion and philosophy, um, religion and science or philosophy. And then he also refers to Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas did not split reason, science, and faith, and flourishing. He was Catholic. And then Averroes, he refers to, same thing. He wrote, Averroes wrote commentaries on Aristotle. He was Muslim, okay? There, another um, Aristotelian Muslim was named Avicenna. 
So they were all doctors, scientists, philosophers, theologians. They all sort of synthesized everything. And so I want you to come with your comments about that and reactions in general. And then um, you also could synthesize. You can start synthesizing this. Does this... Does this article relate back to your thoughts about Jesus and Socrates? Does it relate to um, your thoughts about Socrates and democracy? Do you think these kinds of interviews, these kinds of um, uh, websites, that what Krista Tibbetts project, the Union of Science and Religion, do you think it makes a good contribution to preserving our democracy? Um, whether or not you agree with this one or that one, I do want to ask you, do you think it will strengthen the social fabric and help preserve our democracy? Or do you think things like this undermine our democracy? She would definitely be labeled uh, a humanist, a liberal, or a relativist. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there's people who like her who would definitely label they the people they disagree with, right, in a negative way. So, so the, the idea is not to do that either way. So we'll talk about that. Um, then the next article, so I will shut off the recording at this point and ask students in class, well, actually, I guess I don't show the recording in class. Anyway, we'll talk about that for a while. And then I'll you will have read the article on revenge and the issues that I wanted to bring up about revenge are that when people start using science to justify either um, human beings are by nature competitive. So our human beings are by nature competitive, adversarial, materialistic, self-indulgent. Um, that can justify why you have to turn to Jesus or it can justify why it's okay to just have a society that feeds those the desire to get rich, and then everybody will get richer. <laughs> or if people say people by nature are cooperative, and so it's really unnatural to set up the com a competitive capitalist system. So, um, so socialism, right? We're eliminating the private sector economy totally and getting people to get along is the answer because people naturally cooperate. Well, first of all, nobody really believes any of those extremes anymore. Everybody accepts some kind of regulated capitalism and some kind of taxes for public education, public health care. What they disagree on is how much and what the quality should be and what the circumstances, they disagree on the details, but nobody really is a completely no government person or a completely all government person. Um, so, but when people start using science to justify these things, I like this article because what he says is we have a revenge an aggressive instinct, but we also have a cooperative instinct. And we each one of them is tied to survival, right? In each one, you can get a trigger, you can get a situation where either um, competition or cooperation will trigger, right? So just to remind you, he says with forgiveness, we keep thinking we don't that we don't hear that many stories about people forgiving each other in the public, but in our daily lives, we do it all the time. And we do it because we wouldn't survive if we didn't do it. 
Um, and I want to point out that that's Aristotle's virtue of sociability. So this is just the advantage I have in that, you know, I've studied it a lot. So I can read this stuff and I can put it on that list. And I think that's important because you can start seeing patterns and you can start recognizing in your life, a situation will come up and you could go, oh, that's the classical virtue of anger. That's what we talked about in, you know, with McCullough or um, depression or stress or whatever. So you can start to see the connections, the way these things connect to each other and then the way they link to your life. That's ultimately where you want to go. Um, all right, so before the rule of law, all right, it's very important to understand what the rule of law has done for the cultivation of higher levels of flourishing. Um, if you remember, Socrates uh, supported the rule of law. That's what he was supporting when Crito told him to throw out the rule of law and, and hightail it out of there, right? So Athens was set up as a constitutional government, the rule of law. And they thought they were superior because of that. It wasn't just the arbitrary rule of a monarch and his you know, children who inherit power without having to show that they have any capability for exercising it. It's true because I said so and I'm the king and stuff it, right? No. <laughs> or a group of aristocrats, right? I get to exercise power because I'm of this family and our family has ruled for centuries. So stuff it, you know, they don't have to prove it. They can do whatever they want just because of their birthright. Well, a constitutional government uh, run by elected officials is way better. I think all of you would agree that it's better because it, it at least establishes the possibility that people will cultivate their abilities and they will get in positions of power based on the fact that they have exhibited the ability to exercise power, right? You don't get power because who your daddy is <laughs> or maybe your mommy, right? You get it because you're good at this. Um, I think every one of you would agree to that, but I think the Athenians would agree to it, except they had no respect for the rule of law. <laughs> I'm going to help my family and friends. If I have money, I can do it. If I don't have money, I get screwed. So what happened was they lost that um, basic rule of law is necessary for anything beyond this, the spiral downward of revenge. And so I do want you to, to know it's important that when Jesus referred to an eye for an eye, it is said, an eye for an eye, but I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Okay, the eye for an eye in um, the Old Testament didn't mean, you know, we associate it with, ah, you get me, I can do whatever I want, I can take revenge. That wasn't what it was about. It was a kind of limit to how much revenge you could take. So if somebody pokes out your eye, you can poke out their eye, but you can't go kill their family to get back. You can't overreact. So this is actually a kind of mean between extremes of you can't do anything. So people can harm each other without any legitimate, any, any uh, community agreement about um, what's a legitimate reaction. So on one extreme, people do anything they want and, and it's prohibited to defend yourself or to get some kind of revenge. And then on the other hand, you can get as much revenge as you have the power to get. 
Okay, so this is the mean. You, you get to do to the other person exactly what they did to you. All right. Um, then Mr. McCullough points out that, that the rule of law really is a higher level of culture and civilization. And by nature, because we are capable of all those higher level uh, abilities, uh, ways of flourishing, the rule of law is naturally better. And that's what Plato said about Athens. Um, so the, the, these ideas of survival of fitness is way too simplistic. But Jesus' idea of everyone forgiving everybody all the time, we just need more love. <laughs> That's the 60s, I don't know. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, and the flower children and all that stuff, okay? Um, no, you, you need, it's a lot more complicated than that too. Um, all right, anger. So then he legitimate, you know, rational anger is a moral response. If you remember, Aristotle said, anger, there is rational anger for the right reason in the right way. Not getting angry when you should get angry is not a virtue, it's a vice. Um, because you're not holding people accountable. You're not reacting appropriately and explaining why that's appropriate. That's how you have education. You teach each other what's appropriate. And you also have a system that institutionalizes behavior and a political system, and then also a social system that you, you, you know, people talking to each other can agree. The norm is that this is worth getting angry about. This is not worth getting angry about. And together, if they get good at that, they get to a higher level of civilization. Um, so that he does point out that we actually cooperate with people we don't know. And that's that with Athens and with Aristotle's virtues, we live together. Uh, a fellow citizen is political association. So I talked about different levels of association. There's family for the sake of just surviving. There's um, the village for the sake of uh, surviving more efficiently. So that's Sudzane. Actually, I didn't mention this, but three levels for Aristotle. Living, living together, and then living well. And he said, political association is substantially different because it's for the sake of the good life. And that's what uh, Plato also said about Athens, that the idea that you can think about citizenship and you can identify with being a citizen means that you're deliberating about people, the lives of people you don't know and you might never meet. So this is very important. And this is what our founders really wanted people to develop. So when it comes to issues like taxation or um, education or guns or healthcare or abortion or um, uh, discrimination, all these things, you have to think about what would be a good policy right? You don't think about what your preacher says. You don't think about what feels good. You think about which decisions are most likely to weave the social fabric together to encourage people to cooperate. So you incentivize through laws and norms cooperation, and you disincentivize, right? You, you punish or you um, um, sort of socially marginalize somebody who undermines cooperation. Um, then he points out that we actually tolerate mistakes a lot uh, without even thinking about it, but we do it. And it is important for you to think about it. And then the Oklahoma bombing, I plan to, to use an excerpt from the online 
uh, podcast or whatever it's called, um, where they interview Bud Welsh. And so I hope, you know, you can identify with this man. At first, he was really mad. <laughs> he wanted to fry the guy, right? And then um, he decided he would at least go to talk to McVeigh's father. And then he had empathy, right? Sometimes you have to, in liberal education, you get exposed to opinions and theater and music and literature. The point is that you learn how to expand your imagination, liberate yourself from your own uh, limitations, right? The bubble you're in. So Bud Welsh was able to liberate his mind and imagine being that father. And that's what liberal education is about. It's what life's about. But liberal arts colleges try to institutionalize that. But of course, it does. I mean, you know, people can graduate from liberal arts schools and be very bigoted and biased. Nobody can make them expand their minds. But we can keep sort of hammering it over your head if what we're trying to do. Um, so that's when he realized this isn't going to solve the problem. Okay. And so, but McCullough said, you know, forgiveness doesn't occur in a vacuum. Um, McCullough, I mean, but Bud Welch had to be convinced that McVeigh would get life in prison without parole, right? He, the, the kid would suffer. He would be punished. He just changed his mind about what would be appropriate punishment. He decided death penalty was too extreme. But Mr. McCullough points out that we had a system of laws in place and McVeigh would be uh, called guilty, right? A jury or a judge would determine his guilt and he would be in prison. Um, so you have to have all of that in order to actually forgive somebody, right? And this is what I worry about. And you can think about this. Um, is our social fabric um, unraveling? Do people have less trust for each other? Do they have less goodwill for each other? When people don't trust each other, 40% um, of Americans carry guns. And also a lot of states are passing what's called stand your ground laws. And what's underlying that is that they don't trust that the police will be there when they need them. And that if somebody does uh, threaten their life, that they will get arrested and they will get uh, taken to court and the decision against them will get made and they'll be put into prison for appropriate time. They have to trust that system. And so stand your ground laws seem to imply that people don't trust the system. Now, it might be because uh, political politicians gain by telling people that the system is broken, or it might be because the system actually is broken. Um, so you have to be really careful about whether the public is getting manipulated or whether this is appropriate. Um, anyway, Mr. Welch could trust that Tim McVeigh was going to get appropriate punishment. Um, and so um, bullying, so a kid that gets bullied doesn't trust that the bullies are going to get punished. He might not even report it. So that's where sometimes the, the kids that end up shooting because they've been bullied, they don't overtly get angry, right? They hold a grudge. And so what they need to do, of course, is go to the authority figures 
explain what's happening, and then the bullies would get punished. So that's, you know, not taking it to the legal, the state legal system, but it is taking it to the rules and regulations in the school or on the playground or whatever. So it's the same process. Um, so I just want to emphasize that every day in your life, you're going to run into these scenarios. Maybe not every day, but I mean, over and over again, the situations you're in, there should be laws and policies. When something, somebody violates them, people need to know that they have someone to go to, that the person will get punished, and then the social fabric will not unravel. We need a, a robust system of just laws, appropriately enforced, that people actually trust. Um, so then he uses examples, right, of extreme cases. And what I want to bring up here is um, I have had some students writing papers about this. I had one who talked about the situation. I have a student who actually has been to Uganda uh, for a long period of time and, and worked with these people who have this trauma and try to get their families back together, trying to get the community back together. Um, yeah, Lion students are pretty amazing. So you have a lot to live up to. I want you each to like go for it. See how, see how much you can develop yourself, you know, do more than you ever thought possible. Um, and uh, what both of them focus on is mothers and children, because mothers want, you know, a better world for their children. And they, you know, they don't care about all that revenge. That if forgiveness and working together is going to make a better world for my kid, I'm going to do it. I don't care about principles or whatever. Then I have a student from Cambodia and her, her parents were recruited as child soldiers and they killed people. So, um, you know, they regret it and they're back and they have their life and they had their daughter and now she's in college. Um, but she definitely understands, right? The importance of politics and what happens when it dis, uh, doesn't work. So it always amazes me when students say I'm not political because most people in the world are aware of politics because they know how much difference it makes. So I would like to emphasize, not only does it make a difference, but if you don't promote a strong middle class, you'll lose it. And then you'll start understanding what it was, all the work that other people did to make your life a lot more secure than it, it would otherwise have been. I, so for some reason, I always understood that. And I always wanted to give back. Like when I look at the world, I see this whole history of people who have tried to create a middle class so that I would have, uh, I inherited this legacy that I didn't earn. <laughs> And I do want to pass, pass it on, right? I, it always is, I'm very aware of that. So I hope you'll become a little bit more aware of the political association and how important it, it is. Um, so he ends up with the same sort of conclusion as, um, as Mr. Newland, right? You should love people who are different from you, same as Jesus. So there's nothing inconsistent with following the golden rule and being a good democratic citizen, unless you insist that you have to be Christian or a certain kind of Christian in order to exercise virtue. But Jesus didn't think so. He embraced all sorts of social misfits, people that the religious leaders condemned, 
Jesus embraced them because it all was based on their virtues or vices. Okay, so that's it. And um, I will see you on Monday, right, at 6.15. And I hope, you know, things are going well. Um, this is one of the busiest weeks in my whole career of teaching. So I do not know uh, about getting the posts read and getting the papers read. I have 25 hours of contact time with students, but it's just for a week and life will go on. And my best friend is here and it's just pretty crazy. But I will say that I'm pretty patient with students also. Uh, in general, they can give me a reason and it's mostly, it's important for them to keep up it's easier if they stay up in the material so they don't have to go back and look at the video and try to, it's, it's a lot more energy if you get behind. So for your sake, I would encourage you to stay, um, uh, keep up, but I, I'm not going to, you know, punish you or make you think, you know, there's something wrong with you. So <laughs> I have to, hope that students will forgive me if I can forgive them, speaking of forgiveness. Oh, that was really the punchline, right? We talked all about forgiveness, just so you'll forgive me. So. <laughs> all right, I'll see you soon.